My name is Richard Browning. I'm the founder and chief test pilot from Gravity and we build and fly these thousand horsepower jet suits you can see behind me. So I get asked sometimes where this idea came from and I guess the answer to that question really is it's a combination of inspiration. Some of it from my family background which was from the world of aviation and engineering. Some of it's from my time with the Royal Marines and the military which teaches you a lot about human capability. You know it's amazing what you can train human beings to do. And I suppose the last piece was a bit of a childhood fascination with flight. I used to build and make model aircraft with my late father and you put all of those together, I suppose sprinkled with a layer of delight in taking on unusual challenges, I hatched this idea, could you reimagine human flight? So if we started the first iterations around March 2016, by November 2016 I'd got the very first, I suppose you could define it as very first flight done, it was around six seconds of not falling over and landing back on my feet, so I class that as the very first flight. Since then, it's been a question of just relentlessly iterating and improving the concept. And actually that's been entirely about looking at ways of endlessly improving every single aspect of how this works. And actually additive, being able to print endless prototypes that are forever tweaking, being tweaked and improving. Uh, that's been a huge part of that journey. Uh, my name's Jordan, so I'm a, an engineer here at Gravity. Uh, I'm just finishing my PhD in 3D printing and robotics at the Bristol Robotics Lab, uh, which works quite well with a lot of the stuff we do here. A lot of the, the suits and um, auxiliary systems are all 3D printed, so we use it for, for everything from uh, sort of initial prototype parts and, and mock-ups and jigs, all the way to, to final use parts that have seen um, sort of hundreds of, of flights uh, and really uh, harsh conditions. Everything from from structural elements to hold to jet, jet engines to uh, more cosmetic pieces. The different processes we use for, for different applications. So um, we'll have uh, uh, an FDM printer in the lab to do uh, quick parts to, to fix an issue or to do some prototypes. Uh, and then we might look at a more high-end printer or a more ex exotic material for more demanding applications if, if the time comes up. So my journey with additive with, with 3D printing started with a small Ultimaker 3 and actually that taught me a lot about the uh, potential of, of the technology really and actually led us eventually down a road of yes printing lots of our own parts from a prototype perspective but actually down into the much more sophisticated world of, of, of SLS and actually laser powder bed printing to produce actually most of what you can see behind me are actually entirely 3D printed and it's just brilliant to see, not only is it an amazing way of prototyping and iterating design concepts, but actually has now matured into a small scale production capability as well. The ability to turn a CAD design into something tangible and testable within a matter of hours or at most a day or so, uh, has been absolutely critical to our progress. I, I couldn't imagine that we would have to like injection mold something where maybe the mold costs 10, 50, 20,000 pounds or so, and then find that we want to tweak the design slightly. I mean, that just would not work for us. And actually in the old days, we used to build, you know, bolt and rivet bits of aluminium together to produce the test structures. And it was immensely slow. And when you're then doing another iteration, you have to almost start again. Whereas now we just tweak the CAD model and print again. Yeah, so we've got uh, the Ultimaker S5 here. Um, and it's it's one of the, or if not the, the workhorse of the, the lab for making, um, the first version of whatever parts we might be designing. So that could be a, a new mount or a new jig for, for manufacturing something. Um, and we know that we can depend on the, the Ultimaker and we, could, we know how to print with it really, really well. So it's been great to uh, trial the BCN printer. The build space is, is excellent and we've been able to print some really, truly huge pieces in this lab, which has been really valuable. And, it, and it's a great kind of, I suppose, additional machine to the um, 5S that we rely on hugely now. Yeah, so the, the, the BCN um, comes in handy when you, we need a, a, a bigger part that's going to take a lot longer. Um, and we can have the Ultimaker doing sort of a, a, a few different parts throughout the day and then the BCN can be doing a, a longer print uh, over the weekend or, or something that couldn't quite fit in the build volume of the, the Ultimaker. So uh, as helpful and as useful as the FDM printers in the lab are, um, not every part is, is most suited to that sort of process. Um, some of the, the larger pieces on the suits or some of the parts which need a bit of extra strength and durability or a more complex geometry uh, are more suited to a, a powder-based process like multi-jet fusion. Um, and so those sort of 
those sort of processes uh, that create the part out of powder can be a lot more useful for, for demanding applications or, or things where we need something a bit different that we can't necessarily do in the lab. So going beyond the kind of FDM machines we have here to the HP multi-jet fusion system has been fantastic because it allows us to build not only very large parts but also they're structurally even more integral uh, and just just fantastic. I mean sometimes we joke they look like they've fallen off a spaceship. They are such amazing creations. Um, I think we'll continue to to manufacture more and more parts um, using sort of multi-jet fusion process uh, and even the standard uh, like PA12 nylon materials, we found that they've been quite quite robust and the print quality on them is is amazing and it it really lets us go wild in uh, in some of the 3D modeling we can do because we we know we can trust the, the the process to create a really nice part afterwards that looks good but is also as structural as well. So 3D printing fits in really well with uh, a company like Gravity because we're we're rapidly making changes to all of our our designs and and different um our iterating over those designs super quick means that 3d printing is one of the only options for that sort of thing um obviously there's a lot of components on the, the jet suits that aren't 3d printed at the moment um but we use 3d printing to to integrate all of those parts together in a, a really novel product in a in a new way um and then we'll either strengthen that with with other metal supports um, or try and figure out how we can um, over time consolidate multiple parts down into a single 3d printed parts um, there is the potential for for going to a higher volume in the future with with injection molding but i don't think that that would ever remove the need for for 3d printing especially in uh, sort of the r d phases in even in a lot of the final use uh, parts as well it's been fantastic to have great support from 3D and from Steve. The world of additive is just advancing so fast. It's invaluable for us to have the advice on adopting or even just trialing every new development that comes through. And that's part of why we make such fast progress. So this whole concept started with an idea that wasn't really supposed to be possible. And over those four to five years or so, we have gone from a, a, an unproven idea through to something that now has grown into a very large business. We've got, I think we've accumulated 152 events in 35 countries. We've got a, an amazing kind of entertainment side to our business and trained over 500 people. But also there's a professional division around paramedic response and special forces mobility, which I never could have imagined, which is growing really rapidly. And I just see additive as an integral part of that journey. And actually it could be really exciting in the future, not only to produce the relatively small numbers of cutting edge prototypes, but I can see it actually increasingly being part of our larger scale production future. So in terms of innovation, I think additive is just a massive catalyst to, to, to an innovation. Innovation is it, to us all about having an idea, maybe sometimes a seemingly crazy idea, and identifying as quickly as possible how you can test that concept. And really, probably, fail as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible because you have to get through quite a lot of those before you make the breakthrough that you maybe never even imagined when you started you know welcome to innovation now if you've got a manufacturing process that allows you to actually advance through those failures really fast to get to the breakthrough well welcome to additive that that's a massive catalyst as i say to innovation Thank you.